Okay. Testing. Yeah, we're good. I want to introduce our guest speaker. I'm Michael Boyvin. I'm a professor in the departments of psychiatry and neurology and ophthalmology. I head up our uh, neurodevelopmental Thrive Always research program in the Department of Psychiatry. Um, most of my work is, is, is in Africa, and I've known Dr. Esperance Kashala Botne, our, our guest speaker for this afternoon, since 2010 when we began working together on the um, Konzo Prevention Project as a spin-off from her uh, Norwegian Research Council funded work in the area of Enfance Africaine, which she can you know, explain more about as, as we go. Um, we were co-PIs on the first inaugural um, cohort of grants from the African Alliance Partnership and that just recently ended and then uh, thankfully this work is able to continue through funding from Grand Challenges Canada that was awarded um, this past year and um, Dr. Kishala Botne is the principal investigator on that and thankfully again we're recently been designated for um, a two-year grant from the National Institutes of Health to, to continue some of the work the foundation for which Dr. Kishala Bodney is going to be describing uh, for you this afternoon. Um, just a brief personal note, I, my wife, uh, my connection with, with the Congo is um, my, my wife grew up there and actually was instrumental in my very first trip to Africa in 1989. Um, and we ended up going back for a year uh, with the support of Fulbright. Uh, for a year of research at a small medical mission in the Bandundu uh, province at that time, not far from where we're presently working on Konzo prevention in families and very young children. Um, at that time, Esperance's father uh, was instrumental in, in and the first dean of their school of public health at the University of Kinshasa. And so it's it's somewhat for, fortuitous, if you will, if, if at the time when we were working in the Bandundu uh, on a number of different conditions in child neurodevelopment, uh, Esperance was, um, her father and, and the way was, the kind of the die was cast for her future in terms of, of her own medical and public health work. And now here we are together and with you all in a very important partnership between Michigan State University the uh, Institut National de la Research Biomedical, with which we recently then shared um, Community Engaged Scholars Award, and last night was a very, very special celebration of, of that uh, award, and, and Dr. Kishala Bodne uh, representing the Congolese Partnership side for, for that award, and then um, our continued work um, at present. In fact, I leave right for the airport from here to uh, head to New York City, present some of this work at a meeting there, and then from there on Saturday on to the DR Congo for the next phase of, of this work. So it's what you're going to be hearing about is all very, very current and very fresh and um, very much a part of, of uh, our lives and our, our research activities at, at this time. So without further ado. Mm. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, really a real pleasure for me to be here. Uh, today and present uh, what we are doing in Congo. So is it okay if I stand or yes? Yeah. <laughs> and I have a better view of everybody. So um, we are working on a disease which is called Konzo and we are going, I would, I'm going to present a little bit so you can understand what is the disease Konzo. And at the same time, uh, uh, we are going to present what we have been doing and what we have found, so you understand uh, uh, a bit of the project. So this project uh, uh, collaborates with uh, universities uh, in Kinshasa, the University of Kinshasa, the Institut National for uh, the Recherche Biomédicale, so National Institute of Biomedical Research, uh, the University of Bergen, uh, Michigan State University and Oregon Health and Science University. So as uh, uh, Michael uh, mentioned, he has been uh, working 
in Africa for more than 30 years. Huh? And the first time, I don't know why it doesn't oh, come. No, there, yeah. there it comes. So he started uh, looking at children uh, cognitive for more than 30 years, approximately. So that's a picture of uh, his uh, first introduction to Africa. It doesn't work anymore. Okay. okay. So with the KBC. Which is still one of the principal tests we're using now to look at the neurocognitive effects of cognitive. Mm. And the first time that test was introduced, it was to uh, assess the effect of treatment on intestinal parasite among children in Congo, okay, living in a, a remote area in the Congo. You want to say something about it? No, no? Good, okay. Yeah. So that was his first introduction uh, with. Uh, 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 through grace, huh, as he mentioned earlier. Okay, as I say, I'm going to tell you what is Konzo. So Konzo, uh, it's a um, neurological disease hmm, uh, which affects mainly the upper motor neuron. And it is, um, the onset is very abrupt. What can happen, a child is fine on the previous day, and then the following day he has difficulty uh, walking, so it's very abrupt. It is irreversible, once you get it, you can't get better. And it is non-progressive, and it affects both legs, it's symmetrical. WHO has some criteria to define the disease. So as mentioned, uh, you have a spasticity, abnormal spasticity. The onset is less than a week, followed by a non-progressive course. And also it ha you have uh, exaggerated bilateral reflex. So those are the criteria by uh, the WHO. The disease is classified as mild. When a child is mildly affected, uh, do you have another? Because, yes. because I'd like to point When the child is mildly affected, he can still be able to walk without any support. When he's moderately affected, he needs the support to be able to walk, a stick or whatever. Mm -hmm. And severely affected are unable to walk without help. So the, the disease is classified on mild, moderate, or severe. The, those who are mainly affected are women of childbearing age. Sorry for that. This one. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, here you can see uh, women who are uh, moderately to severely affected and with their children. What is the neuropathology of the consul? It's difficult to know the exact neuropathology of the disease, but there is an evidence of uh, an upper motor neuron lesion. There is some damages in the nerve cells. I won't go into details huh, because that's more neurological, so I just it give the most important one. So there is some uh, damage and chromatolysis in some of the cells. And uh, it has been also found that there is hypoxia in the neuronal damage in an animal model. So the disease affects the brain. There have been different studies which shows that the disease affects uh, really the brain. So you have clinical studies, epidemiological studies, electrophysiological studies showing the impact of the disease on the brain. And the first time the disease was described in Congo, it was in 1938. And nothing has, I mean, things have been done to improve the situation with the research we are conducting now. But before that, people knew about the disease, but they didn't know how the population can be helped. 
what are the countries which are affected by the disease? You have Mozambique, Tanzania, Cameroon, Central Africa, and even Angola. And Congo is here. It is just in the middle of Africa. So those countries are the ones where uh, cases of Konzo have been identified. I don't know if we will have uh, enough time, but there is a short movie on Konzo. Maybe we don't have time, but we will see later. Huh? The movie shows how uh, uh, people affected by Konzo walk and some of the neurological signs you can see. But maybe we will see later if we have time, I can show the movie. So that's a picture of a child who is affected. You see how? What are the cause of Konzo? The exact cause of the disease is unknown, but there have been uh, um, some factors which leads to the disease. And among them, younger age, women tend to be more affected, mostly women in the childbearing age, malnutrition, there is a genetic component, and there is an interaction of different factors. But the main cause is still related to the consumption of cassava, which is poorly processed. We'll see what we I will show some picture of cassava for those who. So that's the cassava. They are uh, roots, okay? And you can uh, process those roots to have flour and make different type of dish. One of the, di the dish which is common to, uh, uh, in that uh, region is called uh, fufu in some countries. Some country calls it ugali. In Tanzania, for example, so most Africa will know that. So it's made uh, from the cassava flour. So you have the roots to process, to remove the cyanide from the roots, you have to soak it in for three to four days, minimum four days. And then after you make a flour, and then with your flour, you can cook a dish. You can make different types. You can make pastries, you can make the ugali, you can make even bread, a cake out of uh, cassava flour. So there has been, uh, uh, studies have shown an association between gonzo and cassava. So as I say, cassava are leaves. Those leaves have roots. The roots need to be processed before uh, eating. And the leaves also can be eaten. As we just about some, we cook it with, yeah, as a, a, a dish. So what are the impact of Konzo? Konzo has a broad range of impact. We see uh, the handicap, disabilities, impairments, hmm? decreased muscle power, spastic gait, secondary impairment, you have uh, hyperlordosis. So there are a lot of impairments which are associated with Konzo. And we will show uh, later on even some impact which we have found in early childhood. So I, that's a, a picture of what I have mentioned earlier. Huh? So that the, the, the ugali, which are associated with the pastries. And we will show uh, later on. By the way, this is Professor um, Desiree Shalakatumbe. He's a third of our our three PIs and, and the principal overall PI for the Konzel Prevention Project. He's based at Oregon Health and Science and this is him on site with the women as they soak the cassava tubers, um, hopefully for, for at least four days. Please, you can interrupt if you have questions. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> or shall we take the questions later? No, I think if, if you have an immediate question, um, we can dock it against your time later, but, but feel free, however you want to <laughs> utilize your, your timeouts. Yeah. <laughs> because if we take maybe question, maybe. Yeah. Right. I was just wondering what the general prevalence is on work.
Is there, is there a rate of prevalence in some of these areas that you, that you know? Yeah, Kaimba is the, the, the place in Congo with, with the highest prevalence. Mm -hmm. And there, there are anthropologists, I mean, partly it's ecology, it's the soil, the acidity, the content, and how the cassava <coughs> plant then, uh, the amount of cyanide that it produces, in, in a sense, in sort of protecting itself against various diseases and pests in the environment. It's resistance to drought, and then people's dependence upon the more bitter varieties of cassava, which have this higher content of glycogenic cyanide. Now, in this particular area, in the very south of Bandundu, it's right near the Angolan border. And there was a lot of movement back and forth during the Civil War period in Angola, uh, followed by a Civil War period in, um, through, throughout that western area of the Congo. And then in, intermittent economic hardships uh, for both, with hyperinflation, with where durable goods were most available. So there are a lot of movement back and forth, displacement, migration. And in those kinds of conditions, people lose the customs and the social learning of how they can best prepare that cassava. Not that they know that they're doing it to detoxify it necessarily, but the kind of customs over generations that have developed to result in safe food preparation those are disrupted and even lost from generate, you know, within a, a generation. Um, and so in areas where there are Konza outbreaks, like in Kehamba, you can see up to 10% of a village affected, depending on how dependent they are and the, the degree of food insecurity, how, to what extent they've had to take shortcuts in order to, um, to keep from starving and, and then take shortcuts in terms of the proper um, processing to detoxify the cassava. Um, then in other areas where there are food al alternatives, where they're not as dependent, where there are the soil conditions and the ecology is such that, that there, um, there's less food insecurity and less dependence on the bitter cassava, the prevalence can be much, much lower. And in fact, polio still is, is a, an issue in, in many of these areas, but uh, it could very well be where you've seen a lot of the, the types of ataxia, um, the atrophy of limbs, the kind of paraparesis that typify Konzo, um, that, that it could very well have been that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> so so I, I think I, I had a pretty extensive discussion with Michael once uh, with the president of uh, the African Development Bank was here. That's when he introduced me to that Konzo. I didn't know about it. Um, but one of the questions that I have, uh, and maybe on a suggestion of a study that you guys can do, is why is it so prevalent in those few countries while there are other countries of Africa where consumption of cassava is much higher? Yeah. And probably the process is almost the same. Mm -hmm. uh, like in Nigeria, I mean, Nigerians consume a lot of cassava. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to yeah. just quick follow up because I have to go. I'm from Nigeria, and uh, I think uh, I'm surprised that uh, Congo consume more cassava than Nigerians because Southwest Nigeria, Southwest Nigeria, South South Nigeria is a major staple. Food. You know how right. rice is a major staple to most of African countries. That's how cassava is in those areas. But when you come to the northern Nigeria where polio has been discovered, you see kids with the pictures you just uh, showed. In these areas I mentioned, you don't see kids having this kind of uh, uh, disabilities, right? But in northern Nigeria where it's not even grown in the quantity, it's grown in south, in the east, and in the west. Mm -hmm. So maybe something that has struck my mind is maybe the processing, the way of processing maybe matters. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. There are multiple factors, isn't it? As mentioned, uh, Michael also mentioned, you have nutrition in that population. People are undernourished. You have, and usually, when you look at Congo, Congo is a huge country in the middle of Africa. The place which were affected was Kaemba, and not the rest of the country, even though they are eating cassava. But after the political instability civil war, 
we have even noticed some few cases in Eastern Congo. So it's not because you eat cassava that you will eat, you will get the disease. I eat cassava. Many of the Africans here have, are eating cassava, but there are other factors. And the processing in these uh, settings, instead of soaking the roots for four days, they make shortcut because of poverty. So they soak it for two days, one day, so that the roots are not detoxified. Yeah. And you so did have outbreaks in Nigeria, in for Nigeria. example, during the, um, the African Civil War. Um, there was tropical ataxic neuropathies, is what it was called, but it was cassava-based. And there are epidemiological, we, we've got a, actually a neuropsychology collaborator who's working in southern Nigeria, and um, we're mobile, in fact, he'll be coming to our Kinshasa to learn the lab techniques uh, within the next few months. He'll be um, coming to Ann Arbor, actually, for a, an African fellowship for this coming next, this coming year. But he'll be um, working on looking at the neuropsychology of, of cassava mm -hmm. and neurotoxicity exposure in children because there may be subclinical effects. And that's some of the really important work that we're, just like lead. Okay, lead doesn't kill people, right? right. But, but at even small levels, it, over time, it affects mm -hmm. the, you know, mm -hmm. children neurodevelopmentally at, on a population basis, it becomes much more evident. Mm -hmm. And we suspect the same thing may be happening with even low-grade exposure to toxicity within cassava. But it becomes especially acute to the point of a neurological disease diagnosed mm -hmm. as Konzo, um, you know, an ataxic neuropathy, upper motor neuron, when conditions become so desperate that you don't properly process it, you don't have other sources of, of amino mm -hmm. acids, sulfur-based amino acids for the liver to detoxify the cyanide within the bloodstream. You have nothing else, no other food sources to turn to, beans or rice or maize or other kinds of, of nutritious vegetables even. Um, you only have that cassava, you have no protein with it. You're, you're taking shortcuts because you're starving, drought, famine, war. Then you get profound um, outbreaks and epi epidemics. Yeah. I have a personal story, but I don't want to about two to three hours by flight to Kinshasa, the capital city, and the study area is uh, in the border with Angola. So, so that's a map of Congo. The study was conducted here in Kaimba, which is bordering Angola. The capital city is here, Kinshasa. It's about 1,000 kilometers. The road conditions are very bad. So it takes about two days by car to reach the place. So what, uh, I mean, when we go to Piquit, it's about 10 hours, and then you have to drive down to Kahema. Very bad condition. What sounds like a mission. We have potholes. So what are uh, the learning objectives? We want to show that Konzo have neurological symptoms, they have some neuropsychological sequela, and there are ecological causes, and it is possible to have some intervention <coughs> to prevent the disease. Uh, as mentioned, uh, the neurological symptoms, it is a neuromotor neuron disease. So as you can see, affected uh, uh, patients. So they have neurological symptoms. I don't know, for those who uh, uh, 
have a bit of neurological background. In neurology, you look at what is called a reflex. It's a way to see how your motor neurons are affected. And when you look at cones of patients, only few have normal uh, reflex. None of them have normal reflex when they are affected, two legs are affected, when all member cavity paresis, only one. So the reflex are not normal in cones of affected people. And even in those who appear to be normal, it's mm -hmm. only 42, 50% uh, who have uh, normal patellar reflex, ankle reflex, so there are some who have abnormal reflex. And these are children who are not diagnosed with cones, but their siblings of those who may be affected living in Konzo households. So these are normal children who don't have the neurological disease, the abrupt onset yet, but there are subtle early warning signs in about half um, that are, um, and then there are neurocognitive effects as well that we'll, Dr. Um, Shallow will be talking about, and even, even in her very early childhood, some neurodevelopmental effects. So just like lead, early on we thought, you know, unless you're really acute toxicity from lead, it's not doing much, you know, but then over time we began to develop better measures to understand why it was that we had to minimize exposure to any level of lead in populations, and particularly for children in their brain development. That seems to be the story we're learning here as, as we learn more and more about the toxicity of the cassava and the effects on brain development of, of subacute clinical effects over time. So even though you don't see the, the clinical picture as I showed you, still when you do a neurological examination on the reflex, you can see that they have some uh, neurological problems in parents. So here is a graph which uh, uh, shows you can see the scores of those who are affected. Paraparesis or quadriparesis. Paraparesis is two legs, quadran is the whole. All, uh, sorry for my English. <laughs> so the neuro neuropsychological sequela from Konzo. This is a picture of the testing. You know, some of the tests. Uh, uh, my, my professor Boyvin, he's the one who brought the neuropsychological testing in this area to better understand what are the neuropsychological impact of the disease in this population who is affected by Konzo. So those are pictures, some of, uh, this is Therese, she's a doctor and she's taking her PhD using data from the, the project. So you have a picture of, uh, yeah. Yeah, and then he who, who's completed his PhD looking at biomarkers mm -hmm. and neuropsychological outcomes and then and it can make out for the test. Oh, is that Daniel? Yes. Mm -hmm. Who also did his PhD. So, this has been great in terms of capacity building and allowing our physicians to do, shall also do their PhDs um, as part, part of this ongoing research program. Mm -hmm. So this, this is one of the publications uh, which showed that neuropsychological effect of cancer. It was published in uh, pediatrics, yeah, pediatrics, yeah, pediatrics yeah. in, in, in this, 2013. This was the first document, before, when you read the original WHO descriptions, 1996, characterizing Konzo, um, it was characterized as not, not having mental effects or effects on, on um, brain. It was thought to be entirely upper motor neuron spinal level. Um, but this was the first evidence that, that, that um, we really needed to take a much more careful look at the upper central nervous system brain effects of, of toxic exposure. And you can continue on, but but that it was it was a major uh, plus a major concern. Yeah. Yeah. So in addition to neurological uh, impairment, it's also neuropsychological effect of the disease. So one of the tests which was uh, used was the Brinix or skill test to assess uh, motor proficiency. So it assess a fine motor precision, fine motor, manual dexterity, bilateral coordination, balance, 
upper limb coordination, speed, and agility, and strength. Huh? So those are pictures of uh, children um, performing some of the tests. So was, and was interesting, a more comprehensive and in-depth look at functional motor ability, proficiency, um, turns out to be much more precisely related to biomarkers of, of cassava toxicity than, for example, a, a, a traditional neurological exam. So we found it to be an outstanding complement to the neurological aspects and even the neurocognitive aspects of the disease, bridging those. Yeah. So when we compare the control, meaning the, the children or the, the, the patient without symptoms, and the conzo and motor proficiency, we saw that there was significant difference between the groups in all those uh, scales. So those with conzo perform poorly than those without conzo in fine motor precision, ma uh, manual dexterity, so all the assessments of motor proficiency. Even though uh, uh, we had adjusted for uh, home environment and gender. So here you can also see, based on the conzo severity, the control, you see on the mild, the moderate, and the severe on the manual uh, coordination. They are performing very poorly compared to control. And in memory, we have uh, in learning and planning, and also the, um, the intellectual, the total uh, <coughs> uh, score, they have significant differences, even after adjusting for other covariates. Stunting, for example, mm -hmm. wasting quality of home environment, gender, um, with these kinds of outcomes, because there's so many risk factors you really have to control for that home. And particularly given Conzo, outbreaks are related to extreme poverty and food insecurity for whatever reason. Um, to really begin to tease out the direct effects, the proximal effects of the disease, you have to control for these and looking at neurocognitive outcomes. Yeah. Because I mean, <coughs> stunting can affect neurocognitive outcomes, so that's why we control for those factors which can lead to impairment. But still, uh, there were uh, those affected by Konzo perform poorly than the others. So you can also see here mm -hmm. the normal a bit, on different. A uh, bit of a backstory. We were really fortunate. Some of our tests that we use in Kehamba, I used. 20 years earlier, in, in the upper part of the Bandundu, which, which um, as part of my Fulbright in 1991, at that time there was no Konzo in that area. Even though they were cassava dependent, still there was before the main civil war, before a lot of the food insecurity and drought that was affecting later on, Kehemba near the Angolan border. And so we have a true control group um, on some of our cognitive tests because those didn't change course of those decades. And for the first time, we could com compare non-Konzo children in Konzo-related households, the, those normals from, so to speak, from Kayamba, to non-Konzo controls from further north, very similar conditions, very similar diet, but from a time with the same test when they were not at risk for Konzo. And um, that, that was really compelling to see specific areas of neuromotor memory and cognition affected um, on the basis of that analysis. And that was really at the heart of that pediatrics paper. Um, we're just fortunate to have that kind of comparison. In most studies, you wouldn't have that uh, available. So what we're trying to do, I see, so those are the, the control from another area. And those are the normal within the Konzo affected milieu. So when you look, even though they are normal, they perform poorly than the, those from non affected area. In hand movement, in number recall, or in words order. Yeah. And they're all cassava dependent. I mean, the mm -hmm. same culture, the same kind of rural living conditions, the same diet. 
So what, what's, and that's when we began to look more, a lot more carefully at the cyanide exposure through a urinary thiocyanate assay and the level of cyanide in the cassava flour in the household. So maybe that, that, that other Africans in Nigeria would be first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hopefully. Because we eat them. Yeah. Okay, so we have the same uh, results for uh, yeah, other if, scales. Yeah, different. Okay, so um, the the main uh, uh, findings shows that cassava is associated with cognitive. I'm uh, sorry, konzo is associated with cognitive effect. When you have Konzo, there are some cognitive impairments. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, uh, yeah, mentioned in different in the New York Times, uh, in The Economist. Mm -hmm. So the world said that, OK, because when people have Konzo, they have, in addition to neurological impairment, they have also cognitive deficits. Mm -hmm. And later on, we will be going to see small children have also uh, impairments when they are exposed to cassava. So here is even a table which shows how there is a relation between um, one of the biomarkers biomarker yeah. and the different... It shows the amount of cyanide that's being metabolized. metabolized. Um, yeah, with, within, with, and, and this biomarker does penetrate the blood-brain barrier, so this is getting to the brain. And we found it to be a very sensitive, one of the PhD thesis by our, our physicians and our team, uh, Guy Bamoko, uh, has papers with, with documenting the relationship between the neurocognitive effects and the biomarker levels within these children. Yeah. So there is a positive correlation between the biomarkers and the cognitive. Yeah. In, this, in this case, the higher the biomarker, the more uh, profound the cognitive impairment in these school-age children. Now we're, we'll be looking at the same thing within the uh, very early childhood, and, and, and Dr. Michelle will be talking about her work there. Another very interesting finding we found is that over years, from the initial to three years follow-up, you see uh, the consultations are performing poorly over years. Okay, so it's getting worse and worse. Yeah, we didn't think it changed. That, that was the, but for the first time we've been able to follow them up more carefully with I think more sensitive motor proficiency, for example, evaluations, not just overall functional neurology. And we are seeing a continued change over time. And even for the non-conzo. Yeah. The non-conzo living in the same area, but without uh, neurological uh, symptoms, but still there. Yeah performing poorly, the same as Konzo, over time. That's exactly the same also. Yeah, just, just more exactly. detail. More details. Exactly the same. And this was published in Lancet, showing how cognitive impairments and motor per, uh, performance after four years follow-up, how there is a decline. So then after what we do, uh, we question ourselves. We have found uh, cognitive impairment among children. But what about the very young children, you know, five years old? They have also some problems with the early child development. And that was the project uh, which was financed by the Norwegian Research Council. And we found that there was a positive relation between the level of exposure to cyanide and the child early development. So what we did, we, uh, as a method, we used the Mullen scale for early learning. So we used some of the, the scales. We use also a locally validated uh, scale to assess early child development. We use the FEM questionnaire, which is um, an instrument which is used in most low-income countries. So you ask the mother how she feels her child is developing in comparison to other children. It's very widely used screening yeah. tool for uh, just the initial screening across large populations of neural disabilities. And then we did also some neurological examination and clinical, and clinical anthropometric measurements to see the growth, the weight, the height of the child. 
And then we had also interview with care uh, givers uh, to find if mothers have uh, depressive symptoms, um, how is the home environment and their parenting style, uh, the medical history of the child during the mother pregnancy, birth and after birth. And we also measure the level of cyanide, just cyanide, in the urine of the mother, of the child, and also in the flour they used to make uh, porridge for the child. So those are pictures of the, yeah, the test performed with the yeah, child. The kids should look a little younger. <laughs> so what we found, that there was a very high level of stuosanate in the child's urine. We found also in the mother's urine, very high level, and also in the cassava flour in the household. And when you look at the, the, the mean, it's so 52 in the flour, while WHO recommends 10. The normal value, acceptable value is 10. And in the uh, child's uh, urine, it was 600, while the acceptable value is around 300. So they have the double, the simple mothers. The mothers have 800, when the acceptable value is 300. So they have very high level of uh, so that's in their urine. Mm -hmm. So what we conclude is that- and, Sorry, and, and those are more, we don't have good markers yet of cumulative exposure over the lifespan, but those represent more recent exposure, yeah? Meaning very, you know, even though the damage could have occurred years before at a particularly serious time of food insecurity or impoverishment, right now, today, presumably where conditions are better, where there isn't that severe degree of famine, those are the levels of exposure they've been getting, which, tell, which is really important to note. So we conclude that there is an association uh, between early child development, motor and neurocognitive abilities. Even though those children don't have any uh, signs of the disease, but their early child development was impacted. And thanks to Allah who helped us in the analysis. Ella, yeah. you got, she's real, a professor in <laughs> clinical methodology and in biostatistics, and none of this work, the grants, the papers, uh, we, we could have done without the expertise. I just want to make sure. She's our key for statistical analysis, helping us a lot. <laughs> so we also found that uh, uh, women reported a lot of depressive symptoms. Yeah, and there was also an association with the child in their own growth, which is a sign of stunting, meaning undernutrition in that population. Okay, the third learning objective. So as we say, uh, uh, it is possible to prevent conzo if you are using proper intervention measure, if you are soaking a cassava properly, if you are able to um, uh, give a good nutrition to the population, if there is stability. So there are factors which can help in preventing conzo. Yes, it is. You're not condemned to conzo disease or risk just because cassava is your main state, and even better cassava. Mm. Uh, there's a, a certain storm of risk factors and maladaptive conditions that give rise to this pathology. And that's, what, that's now where we're at in terms of prevention. You have to prevent, there's no cure. Mm -hmm. There is no cure, but it is a preventable disease. Mm -hmm. And that's where we are now trying to find out how can we affect the population affected by condo? Because it's a preventable disease. So those are the, the future direction, making longitudinal follow-up studies, biomarker, or interventional studies. With good biomarkers that are cost-effective, we can screen populations and tell who's at risk, where to most strategically target our interventions 
from a public health perspective. So one of the interventions is the wetting method. Wetting method is a method which has been uh, um, developed uh, in Australia, and it's a very uh, easy uh, method. What, uh, it's, what is told to the population there is that they take their roots, pound it to make uh, uh, the flour, and then mix with a little bit of water and then spray it on the table in a thin layer and leave it under the sun for two hours only. So it's a very short cut. So the, the sunlight evaporates, because it's very volatile. Mm -hmm. It's very soluble, it's volatile. If we, you can just make a paste with water, mm -hmm. um, it, it can evaporate in the sun in a couple of hours. You can reduce it to 99% safety. Oh, wow. Wow. So, yeah, and the Ministry of Health has implemented that method in Congo, and they have managed to reduce the incidence, meaning new cases of Congo, in 13 villages mm -hmm. in the area. It's just a by concept, it, it works. It can, it can really prevent. prevent just by implementing that method. So what we have tried to do is to come with another method because we found out that even small children, young children, are affected. So it's to use a method where we train caregivers to enhance uh, early child development in the prevention of Konzo disease from toxic cassava. So we think that if we teach or if we help those mothers, they will better use the wetting method. And at the same time, they will improve or enhance early child development and maybe reduce uh, depressive symptoms. This came from our work in Uganda, actually training moms of young children with HIV and, and exposed to HIV, and these are mothers who themselves with HIV, that using early caregiving training, using a model developed by this Israeli um, psychologist who um, won the Israel Prize, which is kind of the Nobel Prize for lifelong contributions in Israel, for developing this early child development training theory and model for, for the mothers. So we were fortunate enough to be able to use it in a, a rural, impoverished area of eastern Uganda uh, with households, communities affected by HIV. What we found was not only could you improve aspects of child development through this kind of intervention training these moms every couple of weeks over the course of the year, but they took better care of the children in terms of their HIV disease, better adherence to the medications, better follow-up medical care, seeking medical care, even though they were in remote, remote, impoverished village settings. So the idea was how to get the mothers to do the wedding method, because it's labor intensive, it's so easy to begin to skip, you know, when it's rainy season, when you don't, when you're rushed, when, when there's food insecurity, you know, to, to cut corners, just as you would in soaking the cassava, for the very same reasons to cut corners and to begin to not adhere to the use of the wedding method in treating the flour for food. And so by sensitizing the moms to their child development through this early caregiver training model, which is called MIST, Mediational Intervention for Sensitizing Caregivers, it worked to help the moms better take care of the HIV treatment and adherence medication in Uganda. Maybe it could do that for our Konzo at risk mothers and households and communities in this part of Kahemba. That's where we're, our research is at now. Yeah. So the, the intervention is called mediational intervention for sensitizing caregivers. So you mediate with the mothers they use their daily activities, but then by using their daily activity, they may improve, enhance child development. The way you bathe, for example, your child, take that opportunity to talk to your child, to teach your child. For example, when you give a bath to the child, when you rinse him, you say, this is water, so the child learns that this liquid is water, this is a soap, I'm uh, rubbing your body, so, those are uh, uh, interventions which are used to enhance child development. 
So the main uh, uh, part is regulating, rewarding, expanding, meaning, and focusing. So they play a lot on regulating behavior of the child, rewarding when he does something positive, expanding. So for example, uh, this is glasses. So you teach the child, this is a pair of glass. I use it to better see. So you expand. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's, those are the things uh, which are done in that method. Yeah, you, do you want to share about the have, having a Uganda come to yeah, Kikui? And, and, yeah, that, that, I mean, that's so significant. Mm, yeah, so we had the team from Uganda uh, which came to uh, Kikui and we had the training with uh, local women, which we identify as leaders who can go into the community and teach yeah, and training them in this method. Yeah, mm -hmm. our, our top experts from our Ugandan. Uh, research intervention program and they came and they trained um, our first cadre of, of community women peer trainers uh, in, in that part of the Congo and it was very yeah very rich so this for example is a picture where you tell the mother how she can use that opportunity when washing the cloth to engage the child and at the same time the child will learn I'm washing the cloth, I use soap, I use water. So daily activities, but at the same time, very good means to improve or to enhance child development. So this this is a picture of the training we had in Kikwi with the team from Uganda, uh, Fiona and uh, Miriam and, and Fiona yeah, are here, and those are the women uh, which were trained. So with this method though, you're hoping that the children are going to grow and actually apply those techniques because at this age, they are eating stuff that are prepared by their mothers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the so, main, I think the main I mean, thrust to the intervention is by sensitizing the mothers to, their, to how they can really make a difference in their child's development, mm -hmm. along with learning about the wedding method and the dangers not using the wedding method, that they will be more motivated mm -hmm. to okay. apply the wedding method, but also, even if they weren't at risk for Konzo, this, this intervention can significantly enhance neurocognitive development in young children. It's used all over the world mm -hmm. for children exposed or at risk in HIV, impoverished areas, with, um, it's used to, you know, I could go on and on. You don't have to be at risk for a devastating disease for this to be still a, a great intervention in resource constraint settings. Yeah. So the intervention has a kind of two hypotheses. To, uh, we hope that the mother will adhere better to the waiting method mm -hmm. through this intervention and at the same time also enhance the child. Yeah. We're finding the wedding method isn't enough because because what we all know we, we need to eat better, lose weight, get, get a diet. But but over but time, do. yeah, we, <laughs> you know, the the spirit is is willing, but the flesh is weak. And the same is true with these very labor intensive wedding method interventions. But yet, with the HIV communities, it surprised us to see the HIV children were healthier. They were not only developing better because of the intervention, but they were healthier. And as we went in and did the qualitative research, and like folks like it see our um, a colleague in psychiatry, and they did the qualitative interviews, mm -hmm. talk to them about what are the factors impacting on your quality of caregiving in, in these intervention households and non-intervention households. And the fact that they were learning more about the development of the children, investing, being engaged, bonding, knowing that, you know what, if I don't do this, these are all the consequences. This isn't just something these other leaders are trying to get me to do that adds more work to my day. This is the future of my child at stake. Yeah, mm -hmm. that that made a difference. Yeah. Uh, so, so going back to the idea and some qualitative uh, information, do you have any information or idea, or have you identified any challenges or barriers to the implementation of the wedding method in these women? I mean, is there something is there a Mm -hmm. or why they wouldn't do it. Yeah, this one, no, oh, okay. about the challenges. Yeah. Okay. But, but, yeah, but of course, yeah. water, we're looking at the first time for the first time because being part of a 
water insecurity. Okay. And it turns out that that's a factor that we, we were always thinking food, food, food. The sure. water insecurity, particularly on this intervention, mm -hmm. is, is, is a big factor too. Yeah, okay. go ahead. Yeah. So the main challenge there, um, water security is mentioned. We don't have access to water. Mm -hmm. And there is also uh, road access is very difficult in addition to that poverty. So the women there are used to um, go into the forest uh, during a certain period of the year. So to get them when they are in the forest is very difficult. So those are some of the challenges. You've got deforestation, you've got ecological degradation, firewood for basic cooking is harder and harder. You have to go further and further to find it. You know, so you're, you don't boil, uh, yeah. I mean, you could go on and on. But yeah. you're, the whole ecological degradation is factoring in. Feeds into the to the water insecurity, ultimately the food insecurity, mm -hmm. and, and their you know the shortcuts and then how to how to counterbalance that if we cannot change the ecosystem and the basic food security resources and culture, um, but we can sensitize the moms to their children. Will it give them that just just tip the balance motivationally to do that wedding method more consistently? So there are quite a number of challenges. Marginalization because of the disease, no when they are affected, so they are marginalized in the society. The social vulnerability and stigma associated because they believe that the disease is related to a bad curse. So that you are you have a bad curse, so you are marginalized, you are stigmatizing the society, which doesn't and then the boys quit school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because there'd be, yeah, for various reasons, but uh, harassment and stigma. Uh, yeah, just the whole cascade, even if they're mildly affected, um, still you can tell. You can tell even mild console effects, and, and there's a stigma attached, and all kinds of things that go with it. That, and the, the, the life, we, we don't have, we haven't published these data yet, but we're, we're actually seeing the life expectancy of these children now that we've been following them for enough time over over years um, really significantly diminished and that, that's that's a really important finding but a very very controversial one mm -hmm. so as I said, in addition to poverty and nutrition and there is definitely a need for social for cultural and social changes mm -hmm. so those are the challenges that the understanding around anthropological understanding of the disease in that community and how we can better help them to improve the situation. Uh, there are also uh, infrastructure when you have to train, you don't have sometimes locals, uh, places of where to train. So usually we go to a place and then we sit outside, we have so it's very difficult, huh? So. Especially, and Sarah, you could appreciate this when you're probing issues like depression, social support, and stigma, yeah, mm -hmm. and marginalization. And how to do that when, when it's, everyone's around, and you know, how do you talk about that? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But there, for example, is a picture taken of a, a training session outside the, this is a, one of the leader. So outside of her house, and here it was in the health facility uh, care. So it varies from place to place and from availability. When it rains, could be that people are not there, or so you have to adjust. Is it like maybe the uh, political uh, will and financial resources make a difference? I mean, if you were able to do that. In terms of AIDS, and I know AIDS has more stigma. This should be not, you know, uh, much easier. Yeah, it should be much easier. But yeah. as I said, the problem is to get access to that place. The Ministry of Health is willing and working quite a lot. Okay. So, but the problem is access to that community, mm -hmm. and then uh, I I don't go into details, but there is also some. Uh, political understanding, because you don't just go into that community, you have to go into the Ministry of Health, 
talk with them. And of course, when you go to the ministry, there is a lot of bureaucracy. Maybe I can mention. Yeah, we yeah. yeah, a lot of bureaucracy. You see the the I don't know the assistant of the minister. You have to give something there, and then he sends you. So there is a lot of bureaucracy. Even though people are willing to help the community, but to get access to the community is a big challenge. I need that picture. I need that picture in my class. Yeah, yeah. A lot of bureaucracy around that one. In addition to that bureaucracy, you have the physical access, no, to the roads, and it's a neglected community. If I have. We yeah. have such, such a vast country, it's so diverse, and in certain areas, and this happens all over the world, it's not just mm -hmm. the Congo, but uh, certain areas are neglected maybe more because of their ethnicity and how it's linked to their political allegiance, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's been a factor. That's reality. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so what can we do? Yeah, of course there are also some language issues. There are a lot of uh, different tribes with mm -hmm. different language, so you have to <coughs> find a way to communicate with the, the locals. Uh, of course, the infrastructure, I saw pictures we do it sometime at, uh, yeah. And there is a lack of trained specialists in mental health. And of course, uh, cultural understanding. So those are the challenges and how can we uh, leverage them. So it's important for us to understand and contextualize the mental health. And to identify protective factors because those women are are very are the one who are the breadwinner in those communities. They are strong women who need to be empowered so that they can bring a change to that community. So we should identify those uh, protective factors and then strengthen the community and incorporating other health providers. Other health providers can be the healers, mm -hmm. okay, or the the, the local uh, chief. So if we include them, it could be uh, very helpful. Because as I say, there is a belief that the disease is linked to a curse. So if you can uh, uh, talk to the leaders, involve them, so that they can understand that there is a need to prevent the disease, it might be very helpful. Yeah, uh, yeah, this is really, this man was our uh, uh, health minister. He was a yeah, professor in pediatrics. He passed away a few years ago. And that's uh, uh, one of the PI in Kinshasa. He works at the National Institute of Biomedical Research. And that's Professor Michael and uh, Professor Shala, the, the PI of the, the big Konzo project. Yeah. And some pictures of children performing tests. So we can prevent cones of disease. It's not impossible, but we have to work all together and use all the resources we have to better uh, uh, yeah, fight or prevent the disease in Congo. Mm -hmm. So this is a picture in Kahemba with the team during one of the field work. And there, you can share the, the fate, where we're at now, I mean, the, in this coming month, how important. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, so uh, mm -hmm. Prof. Boyven is going now to Congo to plan the, we have done the baseline with the, the missed intervention, and now we have the time one. So he's going now to Congo to, uh, yeah, yeah, to, to work mobilize on our teams. Yeah, we've, we've done eight months now from this for the first time. Before that, we had done eight months of just the wedding method. Then we went in with about half the households and a couple of the um, health zones, which had our participating households with the, with um, one to two year old children. Yeah, and we just are ending now our our second phase, eight months of adding MISC to half of those households, dispersed among those communities, and um, we're going to go in about a month. I mean, I'm. I'm we mobilize. I, I would be in the way and it distracts you. But we're going to mobilize the teams. They're going to go out. Um, if we go back to the 
prior picture. Going out two days drive into these communities for, for a month to gather all the, bio, the lab data, the biological specimens, to do testing on all the kids, preschool and school age, because we're still continuing that part, to get the um, cassava flower toxicity levels measured, to get um, our, our adherence to the MISC. We're going to be videotaping. We've got to score those videotapes, look at how well the moms are implementing the care the early child development strategies are being taught with the MISC intervention. So we're at a really critical phase. Uh, for the first time, we've got pre and now post. We're willing over the next yeah, a couple months, the post, pre post, you know, and then um, then we'll be in a position to know do we do we have enough evidence to support. Uh, further scale up, and that would be the next stage for um, for Dr. Kishala's uh, grant with the Grand Challenges Canada. Is the, um, we got an initial two year to, to gather these kinds of data, but now over this next year, scale up for a full region, yeah, to see if if um, we can come up with a a program plan that could really make a difference on, on the risk for these kids and their households mm -hmm. in this regard. With the wedding method, with the early caregiver training, and with some of the screening and other outcome tools that we hope can be sensitive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, to conclude, I will use a quotation from George Bernard Shaw. Mm -hmm. Some see things as they are and say why. Others dream things that never were and ask why not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there is a hope, I think, for uh, that community, and we just have to put all the resources available to be able to help them. Thank so, you. Yes. So who um, <laughs> Who wants to dare that you guys collect and how can other people have access to it, to do research? The research team? Okay. Um, and do you have a process of processing it? Uh, I mean, here, what's the idea? Yeah, so actually, for the, the scale up phase of this Grand Challenges Canada, um, we, we're working one one of the new uh, partner on our research team at Michigan State, Alicia Wu, who's a, a world class scholar in the area of uh, cost benefit analysis and scaling. And, uh, nutritional phase toxicities is working with us now and um, for the cost benefit analysis and modeling mm -hmm. for communities in our scale up proposal to Grand Challenges Canada mm -hmm. she'll, she'll be working really closely with that. The, the data belongs to the Institute National de la Research Biomedical, that's the national laboratory for the Ministry of Health mm -hmm. you know that's the first level we get the identified data here to look at specific outcomes analyses that then Professor Sikorsky will work on. We'll make similar de-identified data available to Felicia Wu. And then upon request, uh, we, yeah, it was, it's, since it's, it's NIH funded, and, um, well, sorry, yeah. The part of the, yeah, it's, you got sub-studies funded by agencies embedded within a big NIH. R01 grant, but but really none of this would be possible without the NIH support. They're, they're maintaining all of the bio labs, the bio markers, the, you know, the field teams. We're piggybacking on that with our smaller grants for, you know, for the, the younger children and MISC with the intervention and the establishing proof of concept. But part of, part of that requirement with the NIH is that we have a, an access plan available. So we will, and we do. There is a, 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 as is mentioned, the National Institute has a survey of where they can um, Do we have any more questions? Um, the microphone, which I think we lost a lot of good stuff for the video because we didn't do this, but uh, the microphone is not for application, but that's how uh, we get it into the live stream. So if there's any questions, uh, um, let me see your hand and I'll bring the mic to you and we can do it that way. Do 
do you foresee? Uh, uh, <clears throat> as you start continue to publish your research, uh, bigger collaborations with the Ministry of Health to sort of roll this out in larger areas than maybe you've started uh, with your initial research study? Yeah, yes, it was fine. There is a lot of collaboration with the Ministry of Health through the National Program of Nutrition. And as I mentioned, to have access to that community, you have to go through the Ministry of Health because it is the National Program on Nutrition who oversees all the, the intervention of projects to improve nutritional status in Congo. And that, that particular arm is called Pronanut. Pronanut. Pro so mm -hmm. they're actually our field teams that are um, mobilizing the training for the moms. The lead person from Kinshasa in the Ministry of Health is actually a, one of the key deputies in Pronanu because that's their arm of responsibility to prevention of homes. Mm -hmm. The other thing too is We've been delayed a few months um, because of pr the presidential elections, which were finally held just before Christmas in, in the Congo um, after uncertainty for a couple of years. And so now there's a new president in place, the first peaceful transition of power in the history of an independent Congo. Um, now that things have the smoke has to clear, new ministry appointments, a new director, even a more recent new appointment, we think, in, in, for Pronanu. So once the political change has settled down a bit, then then we can begin to hopefully partner and disseminate as to clear more romantic appointments, more fluid direct. You kind of have to know who you're working with, and they have to get to know you. That's, that's the key. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, uh, well, let's give a round of applause to our presenters. <laughs> I, oh, I just want to mention um, um, Dr. Kashala Bones is going to be presenting later on this afternoon to the um, psychiatry residents and research class um, that's beginning at about 3.30 p.m. I'm, I'm not sure the room number over in, in uh, the, the fee halls, but then, sorry? I don't know the room number, it's East Fee second floor. It's not okay. floor. Yeah, yeah, so if you, if you wander around there and, and kind of look, for, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll see Dr. Kishala and just, just follow her lead. Also tomorrow morning she'll be giving a neurology grand rounds at Sparrow Hospital on uh, nine, the North Tower on nine, from 7.30 to 8.30 a.m. It's a bit early, it's, you know, neurologists tend to do that, I guess. But, <laughs> but uh, so she, and she'll be around until um, she flies out Saturday. So, so um, yeah, so her, her, she'll, she'll be around for follow-up contact. I get you. I'm traveling this afternoon, but but through um, itcr, um, i f a m i l i a r at gmail dot com. I itcr familiar. Um, she'll she'll be with um, Dr. Kishala through till till Saturday, and then also um, my email. I'll, I'll be I'll have email access till at least Saturday evening, then and, and I leave for Congo. So so. She is around if, if you do want to have further conversations, follow up, if you have further questions, um, send us an email, we'll, we'll, we'll link you up, yeah. Well, the uh, MasterCard Foundation wanted to probably to talk to the... Oh, that's company. right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah I'm, I'm here to follow up. Oh, yeah, we're gonna follow okay. it up. All right, well, I think that's gonna work though, 4.30. Okay, we have some announcements. I, I think we have a few minutes when you can chat to them after this, but uh, thank you so much for coming out. Uh, we have a few announcements. Uh, at the same time, next week, uh, Eye on Africa will feature Professor Alex Thurston, uh, uh, who's from the Miami University of Ohio, and his topic is Boko Haram.
political context, internal dynamics, and international relationships. And this is in collaboration with Muslim Studies, I believe, maybe a couple other organizations. This afternoon, uh, upstairs, room 303, uh, we have an event um, which is part of the Year of Global Africa, uh, titled Bridging the Gap, Understanding and Remedying the Schisms Between African and African American Students, uh, and it is hosted by uh, yours truly. So please do come up and we have lots of food and, and, and this thing. So that's at 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, in room 303. Then finally, uh, throughout the month of March, we have a series called African Women in Film uh, that is uh, being co-hosted by uh, Center for Gender in the Global Context, Jensen, and the African Studies Center. And it will be a series of four movies, starting with Winnie on March 12th, uh, right through to March 26th. And uh, we have the flyers over there. So please make sure you grab some before you leave. Uh, we, have all, we have some sandwiches and chips left in the bag. Make sure you grab some as well. And if you did not sign in when you came in, please do so at the sign-in sheet here. That is how we get the money to make these things happen. Uh, thank you so much. And yeah, you know, you can chat to our presenters a little bit. I'm sure you guys are on for a little bit long. Sure. All right. Sounds good. All right.